Good day, everyone. This is Lowman02. What I intend on doing is a recap of some of the matches we had with our Malira pod deck from this last weekend's uh, Chainsaw Massacre. Um, every Saturday, if uh, this is your first time viewing uh, my channel, um, at 3.30 uh, p.m. or 15.30. I believe the next event may be a half hour early, uh, th or 3 o'clock uh, p.m., and that is Eastern Standard Time for the continental United States. So before we start with the matches, let's jump over and take a quick look at the deck itself. I won't dwell a lot on the deck uh, because, one, I don't think a lot of folks actually watch the deck techs, and um, also it's very similar in nature to the Rexer deck tech that is, is pretty exhaustive that's already up. So some of the critical differences that you'll see in this deck, and the mana base is almost exactly the same, it is some Malira pod um, combo pieces. So if you look in the one drop, you have cards like Viscera Seer. Um, in the two drop, you, you have the namesake, one of the namesakes of the deck, uh, Malira herself. Um, as well as a couple of combos that go along with it. So if you're familiar with the now banned modern deck, um, that still to some extent uses uh, these strategies. It's just not as consistent because it doesn't have the pod anymore. Um, you have cards like Malira, um, Sacrifice Outlets like uh, um, the Viscera Seer and Kitchen Finks, which gains you infinite life, or Murderous Red Cap, which infinitely pings the opponent and wins you the game. Um, additionally, the newer version of the deck, which runs um, as a collected company uh, base deck, uh, runs this combo right here, which I'm pulling out. Um, a Spike Feeder plus Archangel of Thune combo. Um, and if you're not familiar with, with either of these cards, Archangel of Thune basically says anytime you gain life, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature that you control. And Spike Feeder says, hey, you can remove a plus one, plus one counter from this card, which uh, enters the battlefield with two for no mana cost, and you gain two life, which, you know, if, if you're tracking along, it's, uh, it's an infinite combo that makes your creatures infinitely large and does infinite damage to the opponent. Um, it has a standard package of like, you know, Pattern of Rebirth, Natural Order to kind of get some of these combos in line. Um, you know, pretty powerful deck. Um, I think it's good. Um, one thing I don't like about this as opposed to the Rexer build that I have is that it's a little more, it's a little more heavy. And it, it's a little, it has a, little, a few heavier drops that don't do as much on their own. So like cards like Archangel of Thune, I mean, it's a good card, don't get me wrong, but I don't think it's as strong on its own. Um, it doesn't have an ETB per se, unless there's other pieces already in play. Or you have the means to get another piece into play the same turn you put this on the battlefield. So I think what you end up losing are some of the enters the, the battlefield effects um, and the value um, that you get out of a, a deck like Pod. Um, but I think it's a very powerful build. Um, you end up seeing we go to the matches. Uh, we went 1-1, uh, uh, had a buy first round, so I guess 2-1 was our, our technical record. Uh, but I'll end up showing you around uh, with the Sensei. And at the end of it, um, just because it is the cubing season uh, for the holidays, um, I'll show you a couple of cube matches that we had, some some fun decks, um, actually some very fair decks that ended up doing very well, surprisingly, in the holiday cube. Um, also, if you are unfamiliar, this is a Primeval Titan um, and uh, Thespian Stage Dark Depths uh, deck, so it always has a means to oh, always has means to that out right there. Um, all right, let's jump into the matches. Okay, so first round we had a buy. Our first round ended up being against Total Hate, who's on a five-color, um, I'd say mid-range deck, or almost like a, yeah, it's a five, five, five-color good stuff deck. Um, plays a lot of essentially one-card combos, very powerful effects. Um, you know, in retrospect, um, during this, uh, let's go over the keep right quick. So, you know, we look at our hand, we have a Living Death, we have a Grim Flayer. Um, looking at this hand, you know, it doesn't do a lot early. But if we can get Grim Flayer down turn two um, and start filling up the graveyard and just ripping lands off the top, then I'm pretty comfortable that we can get a massive living death and just win the game, outvalue the opponent that way. So that's kind of what we're doing. Um, what, one curious thing about, about decks like Total Hates and kind of what I was lamenting is, um, you know, I had been deciding between this deck and um, a, a stop, not a stoppy base, but a, uh, um, a red green based uh, Blood Moon Valakit Scape Ship deck. Um, that, that runs a, a, a very large volume of uh, a non-basic hate, um, which during this tournament would have been awesome because I think we had about over half the players lost to Blood Moon um, or should lose to Blood Moon. Um, so what we'll end up seeing here in, in this play is, is he ends up briberying, and, and you'll see this, uh, this series of games is quite brutal. I think we get bribery three or four times, and we get natural ordered by our next opponent, I think, two or three times. So, uh, you know, some high power level games. Um, but here you see we managed to kill our, our Primeval Titan, which we're very happy to do because of the uh, Living Death. And right now we're just really hoping that he does not Wasteland us and he passes the turn back to us. He does not, which, you know, well, we probably should play around Counter Magic here. You know, the way I'm looking at it right now is I already have a Karma Guide in hand. If he manages to 
counter this spell, I can Karmic Guide back the Primeval Titan and get our combos into play, and or, you know, Eldritch Evolution to win. Um, as you'll see, you know, our plan ends up working out. We we completely outvalue Enforce and Jesus Wasteland. He, you know, at this point is on a slightly different deck than what we saw um, during the last uh, um, series we played against him with our Rexer deck. Um, in that he's not playing as many creatures in this build, from what I can tell. It looks like it's more of a uh, five-color, good stuff in Planeswalkers deck, uh, which is fairly powerful, you know, because Planeswalkers are really, in and of themselves, card advantage because they have a reoccurring effect if they're not removed from the board every turn. Um, but right here, you know, he's, he's able to deal with a lot of our threats, but at the end of the day, you know, we can just attack for lethal, you know? We can just hit him once and, and the game's over. Okay, so next match, or next round... Okie doke. All right, so you know what we see here. This this hand looks pretty good to me. So you know it, it's got an enlightened tutor, which can get me my recurring nightmare. Um, it, it's got an eternal witness to either recur the enlightened tutor or, or other card that we put into the graveyard, depending on if you know we end up not getting enough mana or drawing too much of it. Um, so I'm pretty happy to keep this one. I do not cast my Enlightened Tutor, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, the first couple turns. I don't want him to know what I have in my hand. Oh, disregard. No, I do cast it just to get it out of the way. I don't want land at this point. Ah. So, actually, correction to all. I actually kind of like my line a little better here. So, what I ended up doing is casting the um, Enlightened Tutor to get the Sylvan Library, planning on using the Eternal Witness on, on three mana or four mana to get the Enlightened Tutor back at a point in time in which my graveyard is more full and Recurring Nightmare is more viable play. So what this will let me do is trade my life resource in for cards um, and get up on cards uh, post or vice the opponent, which is on Planeswalker. So I think inherently if his deck works, which I tend to think that decks like this have a very high probability of beating themselves based on their mana base, um, you know, and or they're just very vulnerable to mana base disruption. Um, you know, I think he's able to get up on card advantage a lot easier than I am, though, if his deck works. Um, so Sylvan Library is what I end up going for because it is a viable turn to play and it allows me to, you know, draw many, many cards. <clears throat> so he plays out Wargate, gets his Deathrite Shaman, which is not a bad bet because, you know, at this point, um, we, he knows we're a graveyard based deck or we can use our graveyard as a resource. So we end up playing out the Eternal Witness on turn three so that he can't nerf our, uh, our Enlightened uh, Tutor find. We see a Bring to Light, you know, which, you know, again, you know, five color greedy. And sometimes it gets there. Um, and he's able to find uh, bribery, um, which, as you'll see, bribes us for an eternal witness, gets bribery back, or correction, he bribes us. And then eternal witness uh, witnesses off of our Woodland Bellow or off his own eternal witness to get bribery back and re bribery us. Um, so, you know, what well, we, I think, had a very strong start. You know, we're just getting battered uh, about the face and shoulders right now. Um, you know, in, in, in rock hard advantage, and he's pulling just decent win cons out of our deck. Um, you know, but one thing you'll see we've done is we've managed to pull out a lot of our, um, a lot of our more powerful um, creatures in Primeval Titan and Sun Titan. So he's not going to get up on mana. I believe we, no, we don't get countered here. So we play the Protean Hulk out. Um, in the hopes that, you know, he's forced to kill it in some way, shape, or form. Or, you know, we get a Recurring Nightmare into play and kill it. So, you see, we draw a Recurring Nightmare. And, and right now, not all is lost. But um, I think I misplayed this Dromogus Command. I think what the, the plan had been is to um, put the plus one, plus one counter on my guy. For some reason, I, I think the plus one, plus one counter goes on his guy. It's a mistake. Um, you know, you see that we get Mystic Confluence, you know. And um, at this point, you know. <laughs> Um, I, I'm thinking in my head, and not to be salty, but I'm thinking in my head it must be nice because, um, you know, you, you really see the um, the wide array of cards available to the uh, five color um, mid range, you know, combo, um, really five color good stuff. And uh, when you see a card like Mystic Confluence, Wargate, Bring to Light, Bribery, Eternal Witness, you know, with with multiple and, and Obnixilis, all in the same deck, you know, it's um, it's very impressive to get a mana base like that to work. And when it does, you can see that it's extremely powerful. And even though I think the deck we're playing is um, is extremely powerful as well, it, it's a little bit more moderated and a little more safe. I think on a consistent basis, it it, it is advantaged against this matchup. Uh, but as you'll find out, we, we do not win. Um, so we go to game three. In this hand's fine. Um, you know, we've got a secure tribal to ramp into uh, three. We've got the Gabony Townships. We can play mid-range with this hand. Um, we get our basic out, um, see and explore our things. We've done three as well. Um, 
we end up waiting. Uh, we're going to end up casting our uh, Restoration Angel regardless of what happens here because we wanted to start playing mid-range. We have any Township in play. I think it's a pretty viable technique. Um, we end up playing our Dryad Arbor, something more we can pump. Play out all our little two mana threats um, because right now we're just expecting to go beat down on him. Uh, we see he kills off our Gavany Township, get it back with the Eternal Witness. One more thing that we can, you know, pump up with the uh, Gavany Township. Um, trade off the um, a Voice of Resurgence there uh, so that we can, you know, really go into beatdown mode. See him play a Garrick, which we're not happy to see because it kills one of our guys off. End up attacking in it. And, you know, this may have been a mistake. So let's pause it for a second. This, this may have been a mistake. You know, I, uh, I only sent one threat at the Garrick uh, because I wanted to drain his life as much as possible. Now, I'm looking at my hand, you know, right now, and I was then, and it's it's obviously not good. I have two lands, one of which is barely even a land because it doesn't even produce mana for me. It's a combo piece. Um, but what I'm thinking in my head is, hey, I get, I get him down to one, and yeah, he has a tutor on a stick, but he's going to need to have two cards to deal with two of my threats, you know, and or he's going to gain, like, a whole host of life, um, you know, because right now, you know, he can put another ground blocker, blocker down, um... But, you know, the angel is going to be in the way at this point, and he's got to deal with that. Um, as you'll find out, he ends up having it. And the other part of my thinking is, you know, if I put him to one, his fetch lands are all dead, which, you know, puts some of his mana fixing capability down. And I have a ton of creature tutors, um, which you'll find we actually draw one, but it's just not a valid play because we don't have delirium. Um, and if I get any of them, then, you know, it, my cards like uh, Murderous Red Cap, to a lesser extent because it's black, red, not green, um, but Siege Rhino uh, becomes a very valid win con, and I, you know, get that thing into play, and he's just dead, and uh, the game's over. So as you'll see, it doesn't end up working out that way. We probably should have killed the Garrick Vice. Uh, so we see Soul Tide Charm plus a four four comes into play. Um, so we're in a lot of trouble at this point. Um, you know, we we can kill pump our guys, but neither of them trample, so we can't really get in um, with any sort of value. So we end up staying back. Um, and, and to some extent, we're lamenting having sent in our um, our voice as well because it's a, obviously protection against counter magic and um, you know pumping the voice is, is generally more benefits. So you see, we draw to reverse, and you know with two card types and in traverse may maybe a more questionable one. Um, it is a hermit druid deck, so I think traverse tends to be okay. Um, but you know if if you look over the the deck list itself, which is on gathering right now. Um, You'll find that, like, you know, it, it's really very creature and land based. It's a, it's a land and creature based strategy. So it may not always be a valid assumption that we're going to be able to get to Delirium. Um, in, in this case, we don't. And it's just a dead card in our hand. It's just an extra basic out of the deck. I think we eventually cast it just to thin the deck because we're desperate. Um, all right. So, you know, we've been briberied again. Um, that Sarkin is really doing a lot of work for him right now. We find a prime time, you know, cool. We end up playing it out. Um, I think we pull one of the DD combo pieces into play, and then I believe, yeah, a homeward path. Um, you know, he he uh, he draws again, and uh, I believe he ends up, yeah, acidic slime. He gets acidic slime off of the Sarkin, which is very unfortunate for us. And you see, this is one of the things I was talking about, about uh, Archangel of Thune. It doesn't have an effect when it comes into the battlefield, but, I mean, we're still not dead, just dead here, but you see that he's got cards like Silumgar's Command that um, that deal with it quite handily and um, get rid of an additional threat. Um, we see he's found a, a way of getting back, um, at this point in time, his uh, his bribery, so we get bribed again. Um, you know, at this point, we just the game is pretty much over. Um, you know, we do have the DD's combo, but Caracas is going to stop that. So, I mean, it's not even really a viable play. Uh, we see Shriek Maw come down off of a Garrick activation. Uh, gets rid of, let's check, I think our Archangel, so we can't heal ourselves. And he finally attacks in um, with his uh, Creeping Tar Pit, which, you know, in retrospect, let's pause it right quick, and I go back and find the, the turn, but it involves the Snapcaster turn. Um, you know, and, and what I think... He may have just missed it, or he may have been trying to play around something like Dismember or something. I don't know. Um, but there was a turn that all of these 1-1s, one and I, I believe it was either a 3-3 a three, three token. There was all the 1-1s one and, like, the little creatures he had in combination with an Alpha Strike involving the Creeping Tar Pit and use of the Snapcaster, the turn it came in to play Vindicate on one of the blocking threats I had um, would have enabled him to kill me. And I believe it was two turns prior to this. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know what the, the opponent was playing around. Um, you know, I don't remember what my hand size was at the time. Um, 
So he, he may have very well taken the, the proper line in this case, but I think he could have closed it out two turns prior to this um, on one of the turns I attacked with a flyer. So just for note. Okie doke. And that is the game against me and Total Hate. Uh, pick up a loss. Uh, round two of the tournament, round one that I play. Uh, last round opponent, uh, Signalis. And lo siento if I miss enunciate that, Signalis. Um, we play a three round game. Um, he's on mono green. Um, they sometimes change it up. He's a team Bija Grigio, or Grigio uh, team member, um, but they're typically on a mono green mix. Uh, so I believe, yeah, I end up uh, green sends anything for dry arbor to ramp myself to two, play out kitchen things the following turn, be kind of an early slash mid range beater down. And next turn right now, I'm kind of looking at a very a less active uh, um, turn. So I get wastelanded. Um, I have it comes into play tap land. What I'm not doing is morphing the den protector, but with wasteland, that kind of takes me off. It's, it's a tempo play. Um, I end up worldly tutoring here after he plays the master, which I'm not extremely happy to see. Get the wood elves out so I can ramp myself back up and hopefully land um, the academy rector. Um, at some point in time, uh, so that I have, I can, I can fog his blocks, um, and really what that would force him to do is just kind of wait until he has so many two twos that he can attack into it, and you know I, I'm gonna die. Um, so you end up blocking out there. Um, kitchen Finks is on a negative one counter. Uh, he gets rid of the kitchen Finks. We end up convoking at this point in time, I believe, for one of our mana dorks. Yeah, for for death right, um, and. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think Death Right was the was the correct play there because it has a few more options on it. Um, we do end up finding a land, which is, is great. We're very mana starved right now. Play on our Academy Rector so that it um, disadvantages his attack with Primeval type. But at this point, we know we're pretty much done. I mean, that Gaia's Cradle, which I haven't seen that already. It's pretty interesting. And and the Dust Bowl plus all that mana production and the large threats he's got, we're we're in some trouble. Um, you know, we end up sniping our own uh, Academy Rector to put a pattern of rebirth into play so that we were hoping he won't want to attack. But as you'll see this next turn, I believe he gets some sort of Elvish Mystic type effect. Yeah, so uh, Green Warden of Marasa. Um, it targets Natural Order, and I know this deck very well. I know that um, what, what he ended up getting, or what he would end up getting off of the Natural Order when he cast it would be um, Crater Hoof Behemoth, which just, just wins the game on the spot right here, right now. Um, I, I can't beat that, so I, I just concede at this point. All right, game two. No, I think that was a fairly fortunate draw for him. I mean, getting to um, Natural Order twice, getting Gaius Cradle and Primeval Tight into play is, is pretty much the dream when you're playing green. That's like exactly what your deck wants to do. Um, so you see we get an early uh, Death Rite down, get Library down turn two. Um, he's got a fast hand as well. Looks like he's got, you know, five mana in his beck and call if he doesn't have any more land in his hand, but likely it's going to be up to six next turn, which is prime time range. We're kind of hoping, hey, he's got a big mana dead end draw, and it kind of looks like that may be the case. When he's casting Cultivate, I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, cultivate's not a problem, but I see his Cradle and I see Pelucranos, which is, you know, not a high, high end threat, but I mean, it's a good mid-range card. Uh, worldly Tutor, at this point in time, we're thinking uh, Primeval Titan. We get very unfortunate and don't find a land in the uh, top couple cards, so we play on our Grim Flare. It's a 2-2, two -two, hoping that we can kind of get rid of some of the junk on top of our deck. Um, if we found a land, I think, you know, would have been a, a lot... We, we, we end up winning this match, but I think it would have been a lot easier to win this match. But then again, you know, in retrospect, you know, you see an Ugin come out the following turn, and, you know, had that come out, um, the turn we cast a Primeval Titan... We obviously would want to lose that resource, so I guess in some ways it works out to our favor. But you see Containment Priest kind of do it, do its thing. Uh, it doesn't really help that much in the situation, but it does kill the Ugin, which is, is awesome uh, in combination with the uh, uh, Treetop Village. So we do get our DD's combo into play after we uh, cast Primetime uh, Titan, finding another land. Um, we end up putting it into play now because we want to get Wasteland on his turn, and we just want the blocker, and we don't believe he has a way of exiling it or dealing with it. Uh, we hang back, um, you know, allowing him to... Uh, you know, allowing him to do whatever he's going to do. Uh, I believe he ends up finding, um, at that point, I, I forget what he called him. No, he found, um, with Woodland Bellow, I believe he was he was finding, um, what's the card called? The Enchantment Senator thing. Um, the, the one that gains you life off the top deck uh, if you draw or take a land and put it into play. Uh, but one of the unfortunate things I think I misplay on his part was uh, he found that card, but he'd already played a land that he did not need to play um, and if he'd been able to go to 21 life, his outs to winning this game uh, go up uh, a lot because I can alpha strike, or I can strike in with my Merrill Age, 
uh, do 20 damage, and he's still alive. And if I have to pass it back to him with that much mana on a Pelucranos, he can probably wipe enough of my creatures at that point in time um, that, you know, he can attack in favorably, or at least hit me with one guy, because our life is so low at this point. Um, so I think, you know, in a different world where this is played a little differently, I think we probably would have lost this match. Now, you know, we say that, but we also have a Woodland Bellower in hand, um, which can find, you know, a Kitchen Finks, um, or, or something along those lines that, you know, um, offer me an additional blocker that gains me some life, puts me up on the life resource, and allows me to block out some of his larger dudes. Because uh, one thing you'll note is, is right now there's no Tramplers on his side of the board, which I'm happy to see because that means I can just chump block all day long and just hit him with my Merit Lage over the top of it. Uh, but as you see, we have Treetop open as well, so I mean, he doesn't really have a viable attack here. Okay, game three. So that game was very close, probably the best game in this match. Um, this game, I believe, just more so just is a raffle stomp in our favor. Um, I, I think this deck is stronger than the Mono Green deck. The Mono Green deck um, obviously has less fixing considerations, but this deck um, has more power, I think. It just has more powerful plays it can make. So we play Amiri's Guile, we see him play Pilgrim, and then sort of meet our Feast of Famine, which, you know, when we see him not play a land on his turn three, we figure he probably kept the hand on the sword. So right now what we're looking for, well, the cards like Green Sun Zenith to find our reclamation stage. Um, we can get rid of it. Um, so, you know, we don't mind being, we don't mind discarding, you know, that much. Uh, we lose a Viscerous here, which is kind of a, a brick anyways right now. Um, but as you'll see, it'll kind of come into play later on in the game. We play a Murderous Red Cap, try to choke him further on mana. He found one, but we hit his Absence Pilgrim and limit him down to... Uh, to uh, four mana, uh, so you cultivate come out. So we know his, his mana situation is going to get better, and um, he probably has a lot of gas in hand because he did miss his land drops earlier. Uh, we alpha strike in. He doesn't block anything. We end up uh, restoration angeling the murderous red cap to snipe the elves because we want to limit him on mana and kind of beat with mid range guys before he gets too big. Uh, see a woodland bellower come out. Um, and as you'll see, you know at this point, um, oh he does get our, our Miri's guy. We end up shuffling, so we know there's like two or three lands on top. Um, with the Recurring Nightmare in hand and the ability to uh, do it twice, um, we're able to turn Murderous Red Cap into a, a semi-machine gun um, of value and uh, and really get after his life total pretty pretty rapidly. So you see we take him down to 7 here. Um, when we use our Viscerous here, we find that we have um, we have a Bone Shredder on top, which I believe we end up casting yeah, to get rid of the Pelucranos, uh, strike in for 3, and then he knows if he passes it back, we're going to, you know, Recurring Nightmare our Murderous Red Cap because he's a 2. Or if he attacks or blocks the Murderous Red Cap, he's going to die because it's essentially, a, you know, a semi-machine gun with a Recurring Nightmare. And we end up getting him. Okay, so that's all the matches that we played in uh, the uh, Chainsaw Massacre. I will run one more match that we played against uh, uh, Sensei Rob um, prior to this event. I believe this is the one. So bear with me, folks. I don't quite remember this game, but I figured we might as well jump into it because we did kind of, you know, lose a round of magic, so to speak. Uh, Miri's Guile Hand, uh, have to play, take two damage initially. Um, so Sensei is on, like, probably a four or five color good stuff mid-range deck. Uh, play on a Malira because, you know, it's a two-mana play. Uh, you know, and that's one thing I was kind of talking about during the, the very short deck tech of this is, like, some of the cards are just junky on their own. And Malira, like, I'm glad he counterspelled that. I mean, it's, I guess I guess it's a, like, a threatening card to some extent, but like it's a clunker right now. I'll recur it back at some point in time if I need it to win out automatically. Uh, we take the two. Um, he plays a Savage Knuckle Blade, which is just a huge beating. Um, but it's also a huge beating on the mana base, in my opinion, too. Uh, play on our Wall of Roots, which is not really going to do much against the Savage Knuckle Blade. We see a bribery, and really this kind of spells our, our, our death knell here, um, especially with the Wasteland following it up. Um, you know, one thing, Sensei like relentlessly takes the. Um, the two the two piles off of Jace's and, and uh, Factor Fictions. I'm not saying that's wrong, but if you look at, like, pr previously, he took, I believe, Noble Hierarch and a Fetch Land, or a Land, um, as opposed to a Cryptic Command, and um, in, that, in that one right there, he took a Tarmogoyf over a Man of War. You know, I don't know if that's always true. Um, and I think those were good splits on my part, because Man of War wrecks me right here. I need to block, or else I'm just, you know, I'm dead. He's flipping my creatures back to my hand and attacking me. Like, I've already, I'm already so low on tempo that... I really can't win anyways, but, you know, if he does that, he wins a turn earlier. Um, so I think it was probably right. And then, like, Cryptic Command itself is, is really, it's a better version of Mana War because it can just tap my team or bounce my stuff or draw cards or counter spells. You know, all of that. It does basically everything. Um, I think it was better than the higher and the, uh, the land. 
um, honestly. But we end up losing this first round or this first uh, yeah this first uh, match right here in the uh, in the game. And we go to game two. All right, basic land, traverse the movement wall, believe finding planes, so we can play our voice of resurgence the following turn. Um, end up playing it out. We don't play wall roots down here. Keep keep that in mind because we really don't have a turn, you know, a, a good turn four play yet. Um, we're kind of looking to draw into that. And I find birds cool, you know. Uh, end up playing out, yeah, bone shredder, getting the um, the death miss raptor. The reason we do that is uh, we know we have a living death hand, and although Lotus Cobra and Noble Hierarch worry me far more than Death Miss Raptor right now, what I'm concerned about is um, it is what's going to be left after the living death. So I want to leave these these cards in play because I think they're good, and I don't want them to come back um, and, and help him fix his mana. As both do a very good job of that. That's why I end up blocking here too. I think, hey, you know, if you want to kill this thing, go ahead and kill it. I'm just going to get it back when I living death you. Uh, we end up living deathing. You know, correction. We we Shriek Maw here. Um, Possibly could have evoked it, but I figure at this point in time, if he wants to attack in or if he wants to kill it, you know, too easy. And, you know, it ends up being, we probably should have. We get three additional damage in uh, before we uh, before we cast the Birthing Pouch we, we sack into. Um, and then we're going to turn the Shriek Maw into a Primeval Titan, and he just says, nope, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Because um, we're still at 20 life, so, I mean, we're not under a lot of pressure at this point. We can pay a couple of True Name Nemesis hits for four. You know, it's a five-turn clock. Um, we're going to end the game a lot faster than that with a Dark Depths combo plus a, an active 6-6 six, six Trampler in play. So that's uh, game two in this match. And keep in mind, this is not part of the CSM from this last Saturday. This is just a casual match that Sensei Rob and I played out um, just for fun. So we Wasteland turn one. I think that's probably I think you want to do that. I mean, I, some people would argue against Wastelanding turn one, but against a four to five color deck, I figure it just has some ways of getting people. So I'll stop it here for a second. Um, you'll see an interesting play on our part. Um, we end up blocking with our Hermit Druid, and, and some of the banter you see, like the chat message down at the bottom, is um, Sensei saying, well, I never expected you would block. Um, so if you look through our hand, like we have a very powerful hand with a recurring nightmare. Um, you know, and that does, well, it does combo out well with Hermit Druid. Um, I've seen that he's on a, a mana constrained hand. He only has two lands, and that thing makes mana the Rattle Claw Mystic. I'm not constrained on mana, but I have a slower hand. So, you know, I just think in my head, like, I have eventuality. Like, if he doesn't have the lands he needs to play his cards, like, it's a five-color deck. Um, I'll block him and cut him off from an additional, you know, green, blue, or red mana. And to me, that's going to assure a higher probability of game win than if I just save my Hermit Druid and, you know, go windmill slam uh, my graveyard into our character, my library into my graveyard to set up recurring nightmare shenanigans. Um, plus, like, w w where the game state's at, you know, I'm only going to be able to Recurring Nightmare reasonably one time, and the card that I would most want to get is already in my hand right now. Um, so, you know, I don't know, it's questionable, because, you know, you could have Hermit Druid, or used the Hermit Druid to, you know, plow through the library, and maybe hit a card like, you know, uh, um, like the, uh, I can't think of it, um, the, the the tutor card uh, uh, Hulk, uh, um, so you know it, it, you could have gotten Hulk and then you know recurred it off of the Hermit Druid and then sacked it with the Phyrexian Tower and gone through the whole combo, but I'm thinking you know he's stuck on two lands. I can win this regardless. I have an even mind sensor as well to back it up. And if if he plays a fetch land or anything that tries to find hunt a land, which I know he plays a lot of, he has the three visits and like. Um, the other, the other, the analogous card with three visits, um, I think it's Nature's Lore, then even Mind Sensor is likely to get him pretty decent. So, as you'll see, I, I think our plan ends up working out. He's, yep, mana screwed. We play out the Mind Sensor, end up playing out the Rector here, which, you know, it's kind of like, eh, cool. You know, I, I know I can sacrifice this thing, but I already have the enchantment I'm looking for anyways out of it. Um, yep, we end up getting rid of that guy. I believe playing out the Primeval Titan this turn. Uh, we have Petter Rebirth in play. It's just shenanigans at this point. Um, he knows, hey, this game's over. Um, you know, I'm stuck on two or three lands, I guess, at this point. You know, and uh, my opponent's going to be on, you know, six with the capability of producing seven, um, you know, and up to nine the following turn. So it's just, you know, that's, that's it. Okay, so those are the matches that pertain to the Malira Pod deck. Um, deck list is up on gathering.com. What I'm going to do now is go through a couple of uh, just cube matches. So uh, let me let me see if I can pull up the, the deck list for these two cubes. So I've done four cubes. 
Um, oddly enough, in the four cubes I've done, I've gone 2 1, 3 0, 3 0, and 2 1. And the most unfair deck that I had was a storm deck, um, end up going 2 1. It's funny to me because the most, the two most fair decks that I played, which was mono black disruption slash beat down suicide block, I guess. Um, and rug mid-range were actually the ones that did the best. And some of that, you know, accounts to, um, you know, for instance, like, you know, league play versus um, single limb. So the rug mid-range deck I played in single limb, um, I think there's a cheap difference. I mean, one, you, you generally have stronger players in the single limbs, um, but also in the league, you know, a lot of folks draft a lot differently in it because they know they're not going to be playing against certain things. Um, which is odd to me. I don't tend to hate draft, but I mean, if there's not a viable option for me, I'll take something out that I know will just beat me. Like, you know, for instance, a tinker or something like that. Um, but, you know, if there's a card for what I'm doing, then I'll do it. Um, but let's go real fast and see if we can find these two decks in the bazillions of, of cube decks that are in here. Um, Okie doke. Well, here's one. Yeah, this is the rug mid range. We'll do this one first. Um, so this is a holiday cube. Um, obviously, got pretty lucky and sacked a black lotus and a time walk as far as our power cards that we got out. But like as far as legacy or correction vintage cube decks go, this is a very very fair deck. I think the funny thing is 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 when you look at it, like our first pick, which I believe was the time walk. Um, you know, can go in a lot of a lot of decks. Um, we really didn't intend on getting the TEG heat combo with uh, Deceiver X or Pester Might, but it just happened to fall into our lap, so we, we threw it in. But really, what you're looking at is a is a mono fair deck, um, very albeit very good mono fair deck because you have cards like Mizawa's Jitte Sword. I mean, it's just a powerful, they're powerful cards. Um, but in a format where like you know Storm is viable or like Tinker into Blightsteel or Channel into Emrakul is viable, like this is a fair, very fair deck. It does fair things, um, albeit it can do it sometimes very rapidly with a card like Black Lotus. So you know if you don't care to watch cube videos, uh, go ahead and go ahead and jump off at this point in time. But I'm going to jump into a few cube videos just for your entertainment because they were they were fun games and I figure I'll just share them. And hopefully if I ever get a better ISP, um, we can do this live. So this is game one with uh, Mono Fair Rug Midrange and Vintage Cube. All right, Steam Vents into play tapped. This is not a fast, like, keep in mind, outside of a Black Lotus draw, this deck does not have a lot of one-drop uh, creatures. Um, so it's kind of slow. Um, it's funny It's funny how slow it is in, like, a Vintage Cube. I'm not saying this is a great deck. I just I think it's amusing how well it did. You know, and I think, you know, one of the attestments to it is that, you know, if you look at the deck itself, it's, it's so full of threats that eventually it is always going to do something. Um, and when you look at like other cube decks, like, you know, the one we're playing right now, I think is probably like a, a halfway decent Tinker style deck. Now, as you saw, our card is a single limb. Our cards, we had the Tinker, so I know he doesn't have the Tinker. I know he's an artifact based synergy when I see Thirst for Knowledge played, or I think he is. He's either that or he's Reanimator, but when I see cards like Murderous Cut and Impulse, I, I tend to think, you know, he's not Reanimator, he's artifact synergy. Uh, we see Mind Slaver come out. We're cool with that. We end up playing our Kiki Jiki here and just beat in. As you can see, like, our cards just always are going to be threats. They're always going to have impacts. And, like, his cards are, like, you know, they're they're good, but they're very combo-oriented. So, you know, all he's able to do when he mind slavers me is just, you know, not beat himself up with uh, six damage. He just kills off our Kiki Cheeky, and, oh, well, we have a, a better version of Garrick that can hunt for creatures in the deck. And we just keep on beating in, you know, and he's getting more and more artifact ramp that ramps into nothing because his deck, you know, well powerful, um, requires very specific draws in order to get the, the effect it's looking for. Um, you know, we find a card like Virtuous Gearhawk off the top, and we just beat in there for damage and end up winning the first game. The other thing is, like, I, I figure in my head he probably has Cordolfo Forge Master. I figure he probably has the Blightsteel Colossus, but I know he does not have Sphinx the Steel Wind because I have that card as well, plus Tinker. So I'm pretty comfortable. You know, you see some of these plays, and some of them may seem more questionable. I do play around Blightsteel. I don't play around uh, Tinker or um, the Sphinx. Um, you know, so I'm trying to think in my head what fatties he may have, and I think it's probably Blightsteel or probably um, the Big Shroud Leviathan, uh, Inkwell Leviathan, um, which is, is a lot worse than, than Blightsteel. Blightsteel is still a one-shot robot. Um, I think it's his nickname in Vintage. You know, he just, the card's silly. Um, so we're doing our mid-range thing. He's got, you know, three artifacts in play, so his combo's online with whatever big, silly thing he wants to play. 
this is to keep on passing because if he does have a a blight steel, what we're looking to do is either bounce it with Riftwing or you know ideally clone it with a uh, Phantasmal Image, and then bounce it um, so that it's just stuck in his hand. So we see an Ugin come out. He ex or he killed. He damages directly our Garrick. Uh, we play on our Thunder Maw, um, beat into the the Ugin. Trade off the uh, the Solemn Simulacrum. I don't. I want to get a card off the top because I'm trying to get a land at this point. Because, um, like I said, my ideal play is to um, to Phantasmal Image plus Rift Wing, whatever big silly thing he's going to play. Um, gets his Mind Slaver off. And at this point, we we play. You know, a correction. So our first round, our first pick was actually Dak um, in this whole draft. And, and you know, it's sad we can't watch the the draft picks. Um, this is the very first card we picked, which is questionable because it is two colors. Um, but this card is so powerful in, in holiday cubes because you run into so many strategies that rely on artifacts. I mean, heck, we're a mid-range deck, and we even rely on artifacts. I mean, we have stuff like Charles Agent, we have Gruel Signet, we have a Black Lotus um, in the deck. Uh, plus, I, I believe a Trinket Mage just to find Black Lotus. Um, so this card is very, very powerful. Um, and, and I didn't like, you know, I grabbed it first. Um, there was no other power in, in the uh, in the first pack, and nothing that really was equitable with the power level of this card. I ended up grabbing it up, and, and it just ended up working out that, you know, we were able to fix with the lands that we got, and uh, we got some decent mid-range threats that worked into that that archetype. Um, so we forced him to sack his Mind Slaver um, off at this point. And we go ahead and Phantasmal Image the Inkwell. And strike in there yet again with our uh, with our dragon. Then he go ahead goes ahead and Ugin's us. Um, that's fine. We're not really Ugin's not really that that big of a deal at this point in time. We're just beating into his. We're hitting his life total. If he wants to Ugin all day, he can. I think he snipes our, our fauna shaman here. Um, he beats in to hit our life total. I, I don't know why he probably should concede it here because I don't think he, he doesn't have anything um, like. That can stop us from winning right here. We end up just beating him with a copy of his Inkwell, um, you know, which Inkwell is like the perfect card to uh, to um, Phantasmal Image because of Shroud, obviously. All right, so that's uh, game one in uh, this single elimination cube. Game two, I believe we play against um, another mid rangey deck. This this game is weird. Um, so both of us have like I guess relatively slow decks. I guess Storm, you know, was just not something that anyone wanted to do, or like very vastly unfair things. So we have our Jitte, um, you know, we, we find another creature, but you know, the power of Jitte is such that um, I'd rather just beat in with the Jitte and get counters. Now, I see that many forests, I'm thinking in my head, this is a mono fair deck. Let's uh, let's just beat in with the Jitte and get counters on it and kill his creatures, because I just, I don't think this card, unless you get it early, can really be beaten um, by, by other mid-range or creature-based strategies. Um, obviously, it can be beat by like something like Storm, but even that's going to struggle because, I mean, with three counters and six additional life. All right, so he finally finds an answer in Acidic Slime. Uh, we get rid of the Slime, gain two life, lose our Jit. That's fine. We've still got a Fauna Shaman in play and can turn, you know, our Solemn into whatever we want. I don't believe, yeah, we do, and I think we find a, a Virtuous Gearhawk, end up playing out the Virtuous Gearhawk. Um, up note, we probably could have played the Trink Mage um, out as well and gotten our Black Lotus, but at this point, like, I... I don't think there's much he can do. Um, I think he was color screwed throughout this game. So I see, when I see the island, I'm thinking, hey, you know, he probably didn't take fixing highly, and he's just struggling to play things. Maybe it's like an opposition-based deck. Um, but, you know, a lot of opposition-based decks without the opposition are just, you know, generally kind of cruddy, you know, mid-range decks, kind of like what we're playing. Um, but I, I think, you know, ours is a fairly strong mid-range deck because that's all it does. It doesn't really do anything busted. Um, but, you know... Per se, but I mean, beating in there with a jit or you know, a sword off of um, a bloodbraid elf is, is fairly strong, um, and it's it's consistent. So game two, I think we have more of a game on our hands this game. That was kind of a non-game. Again, we have jitte, we have Dak Faden, so I'm pretty happy with this. And we have bloodbraid elf, which is you know a card that was at one point in time banned in modern, um, may still be. I don't remember. Uh, we play this, we get deceiver off the bloodbraid, untap our land, play our jit out. So we're up to a very fast start due to the, the Black Lotus. Now, keep in mind, we really weren't hoping to draw it because we have the Trinket Mage in hand, which is now just a, a, a Grey Ogre. They can really do little for us. So we get an Umizawa Zawa Jidin. Questionable play. We do attack him with both, force him to block. I want to keep him off mana at this point. I have the Pester Might in hand, and I'll be able to tap one of his lands down um, you know, during his upkeep uh, to keep him off playing anything and giving us uh, more time to put more counters on the Jidin and kill larger threats. 
we find Riftwing, you know, we're thinking in our heads, this game's over. He's going to be stuck on four mana, um, you know, and whatever he can do on, on four mana, that's what he's going to do. Uh, but either way, I mean, it, what's he going to play? Throwing the last troll? Well, I, I know he can't play that because we have that in our board. Um, but there, there's not much in four mana that's going to stop what's going on right now, um, especially in this strategy we assume he is on. Although I, I do, you know, see some of his fixing now, and I'm assuming at this point he's probably on like some sort of bant, weird bant deck, um, which in my head leads me to assume he's probably on a fairly greedy mana base because we have most of those lands that make um, the mana base I think he was looking to build good. Um, so, you know, if you are a habitual cuber or you enjoy cube, um, and, and I know if you watch like any of the pros cube, um, then they'll say it, but re really you want to take lands and mana very highly um, because they really do make decks come together. Now, I know I'm saying that you look at my board right now and I'd have just a bunch of basics, um, but but I think this deck did have pretty pretty good fixing. I think it had five or six uh, uh, fixing lands, um, which I, I think is enough to make it work. Um, just kind of looking over the, the threat density and where they lie and, um, and the mana requirements for each. So we drop that hand, really not because it's too short on lands, because the fixing's not there. We keep this one, you know, hopefully, you know, we're, we get to a um, a blue land. But what we're thinking is the Trinket Mage can fix fix our hand, which is kind of odd to say, by getting a Black Lotus. Now we pass it because we want our Trinket Mage really badly to resolve. Play Pester might be in turn to tap down the opponent's blue mana. We see they're on Azorius, you know, which we're thinking um, they're probably control. Uh, so we do just top deck randomly the Black Lotus, um, which we're kind of upset about. They're like, heck, you know, we had a Trinket Mage, we would have gotten it anyways. Um, end up hitting a sort of Warren piece, which is a massive beating for for a deck that's half white. Um, and uh, and the opponent is, you know, has to, is forced to force a bullet, I believe, exiling some other nonsense, yet yeah, quicken. Um, so we Alpha Strike in, and what we're thinking here is, hey, we have Time Walk in hand. If they can't counter Time Walk, they're just dead. Um, you know, so we play it out. And opponent scoops it because they're down to three cards in hand. Um, they just can't deal with us hitting them two more times, or this turn for six, and then one more time for six. Um, so if that being the case, I think they were very hopeful in attacking in the first place. Um, you know, but they, you know, I, I don't know what all they're running in their deck, but I think they were very hopeful in attacking if they could not survive, you know, an alpha strike here. Because if you think about it, like, I'm going to get six damage in anyways this turn. Um, and if he decides he wants to block with this creature the following turn, I'm still going to get in with two creatures and, and kill him. So, you know, the attack there, I don't know. I don't know if I if I, I can get behind it because I think, you know, it was probably smarter just to, to block us out um, yet again. Especially with, like, something like Fauna Shaman in play. Um, and you've already seen, like, a Bloodbraid Elf. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, that may be, maybe, maybe my, my thinking is questionable, but, you know, obviously time lock locks it up because, uh, we just, you know, we're fortunate one to draft it and two, it, it's a great card in this deck because this is a tempo based strategy, you know, tempo mid range based strategy. And, um, it, it actually is an attacking deck, uh, which I think time walk is, is generally the best in. All right, so we see a Flicker Wisp. We really don't have a tongue one on our hand. We don't have blue mana, which is, you see, eventually is what, what gets us in this, in this, uh, this draw, um, you know, and, and when you're on three colors, yeah, sometimes your mana will get you. I do think the mana in this deck is decent. All right, so we see a balance here, which is horrendous. Um, our whole hand goes away. But at the same time, like, I don't know why the opponent would do that, because, like, they have to top deck well now as, as, as well. We don't. We brick out. Oh, we get great cards, but they're just bricks when there's a boat in play. Um, you know, as you can see, we're just finding every equipment in the deck. And um, we do have a decent number of flyers. We can get through this. We find Black Lotus, which is might as well say Brick on it again, and he just happens to top deck every flyer in the deck, and uh, you know we're we're in a lot of trouble at this point. Um, so you know I don't think that was a good example of how to play balance. I mean it worked out because he got rid of our cards, but I couldn't play them anyways. And I think if you sit back and you're the opponent, you think about it like, why isn't the guy playing? Well, he plays a three color deck and he has no blue. Uh, finally find the blue, find additional land, and um, have to scoop him up. So at that point. Let me think through what I was thinking. So I was down to two, I was down to three life, fetched to thin deck. Um, I'm trying to think through what I was hoping to find at that point. And it was probably something silly like, um, yeah, it would have been like Pestermite, um, a flyer that can tap one of his attackers and I can equip up. Or, you know what the other one was is... Um, Although at this point, it's not going to really have the impact I want. I think I was just trying to see who's on top is um, the uh, the dragon. 
because it can attack the turn it comes into play. I do have the ability to cast it with the Lotus, and I do have the ability to equip on it the Umazawa's Jitte. Now, likely he has counter magic in hand because he has four additional cards that he's, he's topped and has not played lands off of. So, you know, actually that's what I was thinking is, as I wanted to find a creature, convert it into the um, uh, Storm Breath Dragon, um, equip it with the Umazawa's Jitte, um, which, which would have enabled uh, me to have four life at, at beck and call. Um, which, you know, looking at it now, actually didn't matter anyways. We, we couldn't win. Um, we had no cards in hand. We couldn't equip the Sword of Fire or War and Peace and, and gain life off that. So I guess we were just playing for laurels at that point. All right, game three. Okay, game three. Um, you know, again, uh, have a, a great hand um, with an Umazawa's Jitte, um, a Dak, and a Deceiver XR. You'll see Dak just wins games here. Um, so he found, with his Enlightened Tutor, a Mana Crypt. Now this opponent, he seems like he's, he's pr probably pretty knowledgeable on how to play Mana Crypt, you know, the first turn, but I don't understand why he plays it this turn, unless it's to make a mana to counter my spells. Um, now, it's kind of a moto tell uh, for, for folks. When you're thinking through your plays, don't tap your mana, unless you're trying to do it intentionally. Um, he taps these two mana at our end step. Um, and, you know, in the colors he's in, I... I I assume he has a disenchant effect or effect for Arumazawa's Jitte. So I know he's on that card at a minimum, which leaves three cards that are, un well, correction, two cards that are unknown. I know he also has in his hand at that point in time um, a mana crypt. Um, so, you know, I think what he's trying to lead us to believe is that he has <coughs> a counter spell in hand. Um, you know, that could be, could be it. But I don't know which one it would be. Maybe like Dismiss. But I don't really know if that's in the cube. But he doesn't have cryptic command up. So I, I think in my head, like, hey, you know, if, if I leave this thing standing, there's a reason he played it this turn. I think it's an investment for the next turn. Although I don't know why you play the crypt, you know, out if you're not going to use it that turn. But, you know, I take the chance. I end up dacking. Um, I tend to err on the side of aggression because I think uh, decisiveness and I think um, proactivity tends to win more games than reactivity. Um, end up stealing his mana crypt, which turns his uh, Tolarian Academy into, you know, basically a brick. Um, attacking with the Deceiver XR, which is not a, a great attacker, but, you know, we, we have good follow-ups in Garrick and uh, Brutus Gearhulk, and if he manages to brick on lands, um, which I believe, whenever I see Tolarian Academy, I always think it's probably the last card, land card, that the opponent has in hand, unless they play, like, turn one with, like, some crazy... Um, array of like power cards to like cast turn one Jace or something silly. Um, but I assume that's the last land he had in his hand, and I assume he was relying on it to find him something. Um, okay, so we see the power of Dak. We steal two mana away from the opponent, well, three mana really away from the opponent, gain two for ourselves. Um, we see Kitchen Finks come down. Hey, cool dude. That's it's mono fair. Um, we draw two cards, discard two, get rid of the islands, play out the Taiga, uh, play out the Garrick, uh, untap, play Virtuous Gearhawk. Make the Deceiver Exarch um, essentially trade favorably, or not trade, but just kill the, the Kitchen Banks if he wants to block, and then put most of the counters on the Trampler. All right, we go for cards again, find it just a ton of forest. We're glad to be getting rid of these. This is why Dak is so good. Um, you know, he plays he plays offense and defense. He, he smooths out your draw. He steals opponent's artifacts. He's really, I think, one of the... I, I think at one point he was an unsung hero of the cube. I think a lot now people, you know, recognize the value of a card like Dak. Uh, but I think in this case, he, he really managed to win us, you know, this game specifically, if not a couple others. Um, mostly in this one, just due to the blowout factor of, of seizing the uh, mana crypt from the opponent who, you know, was on pretty much a do-nothing hand without the mana off of their Tolarian Academy. Um, you know, I'm still trying to figure out why they played that out. And... I don't get it. And maybe the following turn that they want to do is cast like an Anjutai, and they just um, screwed up and played the Mana Crypt a turn early. I don't know. They obviously wanted five mana at some point in time. Um, not not familiar with the player on the wind, um, but interesting play. Um, probably, you know, not probably. It was a mistake. Um, and we capitalized on it with our DAC um, and, and were able to get them with it. So a good series of games. Uh, we'll go into one more cube, um, and we're not going to go over the deck. Let's just say that... Um, you know, well, we did 3-0 this. I did not expect to. This is a bad deck. Um, but I'll tell you, like, I think we managed to make it work because it's so disruptive. Uh, so this is a mono black deck in Vintage Cube. 
Um, it does have some of the, the stronger cards that you could have in mono black um, to include like you know thought seize. It has as like basically every discard spell with the exception of the Inquisition of Cold Slide. Um, it also plays Necropotent. So it's funny is um, you know Necropotence. I think people tend to associate with being a combo card in its origins. It's an Ice Age card. This was actually it was actually supported in a, in a in a beatdown style deck. Now there was control versions of Necro as well. There was a million versions of, of Necro during a Necro winter, and Necro summer. Um, you know, but uh, it's hard. It was a beatdown deck um, initially, where it had like uh, the Pump Knights from Fallen Empires, um, Black Knights, stuff like that. Where it just played them early, was able to dump a bunch of threats. Had Strip Mine, which was unrestricted when it initially came out. Um, him to Turek. It was a very disruptive base deck, and then it gained life through cards like uh, Drain Life. Um, so, you know, what we kind of have here is a deck that, in, in a lot of ways, in my opinion, is reminiscent of those decks. Um, it, it has some stacks effects like Braids, Cabal. It has, you know, cards like Ophiomancer and Bitter Blossom that combine well with Braids, Cabal. And then it has cards like Necropotence that just are able to accrue you a, a large volume of card advantage. And because of our efficient threats, we're able to dump our hand and then redraw. You'll see Necropotence actually takes a couple games. You see Delver, which I don't know. I don't think that's really a good card in, in Cube. You get to a very specific deck. Um, to make it work but as you can see like right now like i have so many threats out this deck is, is quick with its threats that even if it were to flip oh well uh we do play the thought seeds out there i think wisely we could have played um, either braids or uh Necropotence. uh but we see the opponent does have a drain so i figured i put them on counter magic at that point and said hey let's let's flee some stuff out of their hand um we see them so our temptation are of the answer which we're fine with we know we're gonna we're gonna this turn i believe we necro like right away when we see the mana is tapped we just necro uh for the fences um, I don't think we go over go over seven here, um, which I don't think. Depending on what you were playing back when Necro was first a thing in Ice Age, I don't. You could you could do that, like you go eight ten, but normally you didn't go too high because you know if you think of Necro in the context in which it's played now, it's played as, as surely a combo card. I'm playing it here as really just an engine to to progress. Actually, a relatively fair plan. Um, which is how, you know, a lot of the original Necro decks actually played out, even though now, I mean, it's just, it's kind of tied to being a Storm card. Um, so we end up having the Desecration Demon, which, you know, hey, I think you probably saw my text or chat in the, um, in MTG Salvation. Uh, this card works again. As you can see, the opponent does have the options to sacrifice to it. We plan to playing our Braids, um, you know, which may seem questionable with him having an Ophiomancer in play, but since the Ophiomancer um, token is gone, I know we'll go on the stack um, prior to my braids trigger. Um, I end up playing the braids down. I end up skin rendering the sower, dropping this critter count down, uh, play out the collective brutality on all options just to dump my hand out again so I can make more room. End up getting, I believe, his time spiral so he can't get a new hand. I don't want more hands to be drawn at this point. And we have lethal in the air. Um, so really, that, I think that, that showcases... Um, the power of Necropotence in a in a fair deck. Um, and, and honestly, I think Necropotence is probably better in a deck like this in, in the Vintage Cube format than it is in the Storm deck. Um, primarily because you have so many you have so many available draw sevens in the vintage power or in the vintage power cube. Um, that you know, a card like this, which doesn't instantly give you those cards, it has to wait till the end step and you have to allow the opponent to untap, is actually probably one of the worst draw sevens. But in this deck, it, it's just fine. It's great, actually. Um, and because of its efficient cost, it's, it's better in a deck like this than, let's say, Yawgmoth's Will, Bar Crushing, Yawgmoth's Bargain, um, which is better in a Storm deck. You can make a lot more mana more rapidly um, because we don't have a lot of ways of making mana rapidly in this deck. Um, outside of, and I know I see a Mox Jet there, but we do have we do have the, a Miser Mox Jet in the deck. All right, so next game. Uh, and just keep in mind, I didn't, note, I didn't note it before. This is a league play. Um, you know, I, uh, so leagues are awesome because they're just so convenient. Um, but I, I tend to find that people draft really weird in leagues. And like I was talking about earlier in the video, and, and they, they tend to be less competitive games. Um, so we're going to play our street mall here. Uh, we figure with looking at the colors he's in, he's got a lot of spells. Why we want to risk it and have that thing, you know, pop out and knock all of our fairy robes back into hand. Um, Okay, so we play our Desecration Demon. We figure, hey, let's get the beats in. He saw our Temptations it. We're not too worried about that. I believe we animate dead the following turn to get rid of it. Uh, yeah. I think in retrospect, maybe... I think I was looking just to end his, li end his life total as fast as I could. When we see that, we're, you know, high tide into Frantic Surge. We know he's on some sort of storm combo. Like, probably, like, you know... I, I can't imagine Tendrils, but he likely has Brain Freeze in his deck. 
Um, so, you know, we start eating his hand apart, and now we kind of know what we're playing against. Um, oddly enough, opponent Frank searches uses his, his rock um, as opposed to his lands to do it, which is odd to me because he doesn't want to get the untap. He ends up drawing Mana Leak. You know, that stinks. Um, but, oh well. If he's drawing Mana Leak off a of Frantic Search or keeping a Mana Leak off a of Frantic Search against his board state, I'm fine with that. You know, he gets our Necropotence, but, um, you know, we're at a point in the game state where if he's not getting rid of all this stuff or killing me uh, on his turn, then he's not going to win. Okay. So, next game. Actually, sorry, folks. We just played this game. So that's the end of uh, round two. Um, round three against a Johnny Gold. Uh, so you'll see an interesting matchup here. This is one that I didn't really, if I had known what I was playing, I wouldn't have expected to win because he's on uh, Mono Red Aggro. Uh, we ended up pulling some pretty good draws against him and ended up pulling it out. Um, interesting to note here, I didn't play the Muta Ball. And, you know, in this format, like, so I don't know what I'm playing against, but once I see the Mountain, I'm glad I didn't. Uh, because Rashad and Port, Wasteland, and Strip Miner are a thing in this format. I see an Eidolon, which I'm happy that he plays that out because I have a Liliana, an active Liliana in play, and I'm able to attack his hand and cool at the same time. Now, Desecration Demon does a great job of going over the top of Red Deck Wins because it's 6 6 flying that forces you to sacrifice every turn. It's just going to outrace you. Um, so I'm not looking to play Bitter Blossom here because I think the card is one too slow and we don't want to take any more damage than we have to. We don't know what they have in hand. Um, but, you know, Mono Red can just come out of nowhere and win games. We see a cough, which is like, you know, a Hallmark card, bread and butter of the Red Deck Wins deck. Ends up knocking out my Liliana, which I figure would happen anyways. I, I, after it knocks a card out and kills a creature, like, I've got my 2 for one out of it. Now, with Porsche here, you know, and I don't think this is a good play. Uh, well, maybe he has to. I don't know. He doesn't want to lose his cough. So he's, what he's playing around, what he essentially does to save his cough, because I think that's his, that's what he believes to be his means to victory, you know, is... He trades two land and fire blasts my mutable. So what I intended on doing is activating my mutable and equipping the sort of feast and famine to it to kill the cough, um, which leaves him up on four lands and fire blast in hand. Um, you know, and frankly, he probably doesn't even sack the manic vandal because if he's going to let the cough die or if he knows the cough's going to die, the desecration demon's going to get two. Um, but what he does in order to save the cough, I think he thinks that's his only path to victory is he sacks his two lands, fire blasts my land, and, you know, then sacrifices his Manic Vandal um, so this cough will stay on the board, which honestly is an exchange rate that I'm 100% fine with. Um, I don't think that's a winning strategy, but then again, like, I, he may just not be winning from this point whatsoever. So, yep, sacks his Manic Vandal, ends up finding, yep, Hell Rider. So he makes mana with cough, which is odd to me. Um, plays on his Hell Rider. We find an Animate Dead, um, Animate um, the Avalanche Riders. This is probably a misplay. This actually, it is a misplay. We shouldn't have attacked with the Avalanche Riders here against his cough. We should have just left it alone, but I wanted to keep him off mana at that point. Um, he attacks in with another Mountain. Um, we don't keep that, obviously. We're hoping for a land, hit our land. Uh, Necrotal is 2-1, and at that point, the, the game is, is over. He knows we're going to hit his cough. He's on zero cards, and I, I would hit his cough here. I'm at 10 life. It's not worth the risk of getting hit for uh, for four additional damage, you know, plus a one mana, three damage spell. I'm down to three at that point. You know, it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm winning the game on the board, but, you know, I, to play around the top deck, even if he's on zero cards, red deck wins can kill with two lands. So I think the right play is to um, is to kill the cough, regardless if I have the option or not of attacking him or his cough with an A-power flyer. So that's the game. And plus, let me do the math right. That'd be a 10 to. I wouldn't kill him next turn if I hit the cough this turn. At least ostensibly, I would not, depending on what my top deck, I guess, was. I mean, if it was, for instance, I do have Clutch of Brutality in the deck, then I could. Okay, and the last game against Mono Red. <clears throat> okay, fine keep. Uh, I like him to Torek against this matchup, and Bray Maggot's fine. Um, so we see Young Pyromancer come down. Um, you know, I, I instantly um, shriek maw that. Uh, the Red Deck Wins does not have a lot of ways to gain two for one advantage or virtual card advantage. And a card like Young Pyromancer um, does that for you. So we see the Cough and a Mountain go into the graveyard, which, you know, we're happy with the Cough. Uh, we see a Chandra come down, though, and we're like, wow, this is a very Planeswalker heavy deck. So one interesting thing to note, and I didn't, you know, we didn't cover really, I, I did a very short, actually, I shouldn't even look at this deck, but we, uh, we had actually a lot of reanimation effects that we managed to pick up because I guess no one was, was playing the deck or wanted to play the deck, um, as well as a couple fatties. Um, so two of the fatties we ended up bringing in, they weren't our main, were Iona and Sphinx of the Steelwind. Um, we had, we did not have the Entomb. Um, we had the Buried Alive. 
Um, we had cards that could discard out of our hand, like Liliana, and then the uh, the three one flying fairy thing um, that could discard. Plus, we had uh, I believe recurring nightmare, animate dead, exhum, which we didn't main deck because they just weren't good enough in the deck because we really only had like Sheldred at the very top end. So we ended up leaving it was animate dead because it hits both players' graveyards and the Sheldred. Um, because sometimes this deck can just get to seven mana, but really it was just kind of like a miser uh, reanimation plan that can kind of go over the top of like mid-range decks that I think tend to beat this kind of deck. Um, but we didn't play all the other re reanimation effects. Now, I, I picked up Iona at some point in time during the draft. I believe pack, th or pack three, like pick seven or eight. Um, and, and knowing I had this, you know, I'm thinking in my head, like this card just wins the game against Mono Red. So, you know, if I put all my reanimation effects in there, already having a decent amount of discard, not to mention my own discard that I can target myself with. Um, if I can reanimate this Iona, I'll just win the game. You know, he can't beat this card. As you see, that ended up being kind of a fallacy because he does have the um, Shrine of Burning Rage, which I believe comes into play, and it kind of makes that line of play a little bit less valid, even though it is open to us in this game. Um, and it may have been right. So we see Zergo come down. Hey, cool. You know, Chandra on seven. We get rid of the Zergo. Um, I believe hit the Chandra down because we never want that thing to put a token into play. That token just wins games. Yep, we knock it down a little bit. Um, he ends up uh, lightning striking our Ophiomancer, um, which is fine. So we play on a Sword of Feast and Famine, equip it to the crappiest creature we have. You'll see that it forces him to use a, a three mana, four damage burn spell on our one, one, three token, which, you know, I'm I'm more than happy to have that be the exchange rate for that card. Um, but he knows he can't discard as well. So we end up equipping it up. We're kind of lamenting that we hit our Buried Alive because we already hit all our, our fatties in hand. Um, so Buried Alive is kind of a waste of three mana. Um, we wish we'd hit it earlier. We look at the deck and say, hey, no, we're good. We don't want to dump any of that out. We'd rather draw that stuff, and we'd rather not waste a card like, you know, reanimate to reanimate any of the stuff that's already in the, or that is still in the deck right now. Um, you know, turn on the Muta Ball, and we're just swinging for the fences right now, trying to close this game out before Shrine of Burning Rage can outvalue us. Um, obviously not casting Thoughtseize. Um, we find an Animate Dead, so at this point we know that our Iona combo is live, but with the Shrine on three counters, I just don't want to take damage. See a Dual Caster come out, pump the Shrine a little bit. I uh, forget what he blocks. He blocks the, the thing that gives him a Hellrider, but since he's getting hit with a sword anyways, he dumps the Hellrider. And I did think through that. I thought, well, if he has a Flash Creature or a damage spell that kills this thing, you know, how do I get rid of the Hellrider? Because I don't want to get hit with the Hellrider um, <laughs> at all. So as a Firecraft comes into play, we go down to eight. Um, but at this point, the game's pretty much over. And we end up doing it as more of a techie play. It's kind of funny. Is we reanimated on his Hellrider um, for Walls to kill him with his own card. Because um, I believe, yeah, before the damage even hits um, him, he'll be dead from uh, the damage stacked uh, during attacks off the Hellrider and three creatures. He's on three life. Um, so, you know, not a deck I expected whatsoever to go 3-0. But, you know, like I kind of said with the rug um, cube deck that I had before, um, sometimes just, you know, mono fair strategies because they work consistently and, you know, habitually have recurrent or have habitual and safe um, expectations as far as what their cards can and will do. Um, and they're just, they're not high variance decks. Sometimes they can just get after an opponent. And, you know, whether it's mono red or whether it's storm or you know, some crazy tinker artifact combo deck without tinker, um, you know, sometimes just mono fair is, is mono good. Um, it does, it does what it does pretty much every time, you know, and, uh, that's really all you can ask of it. Um, you know, so gr both, you know, good decks, fine decks, um, obviously, you know, powerful decks, but, um, not in the context of like, probably like a vintage cube. Um, uh, but they're both able to get after the opponents. And this deck right here, surprisingly, uh, went, you know, uh, 6-0 in all of its games. Um, which I never expected it to do, but because of the disruption and um, the decent creature package and really the equipment um, that it has, it just uh, it wrecks shop on a lot of these decks. Um, so I hope you enjoyed. I hope you had fun uh, with uh, the cube drafts and also some of the games uh, with Malira Pod. Um, also hope, if you're watching this uh, primarily for singleton uh, purposes, that you'll join us uh, next Saturday um, for a 100-card singleton uh, player run event called the Chainsaw Massacre. Um, Chainsaw Massacre is run off of Gatherling.com. Again, Gatherling.com. It's run every Saturday uh, between 15.30 and, um, question, between 15.30 until complete, um, or 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the continental United States. Uh, so I hope to see you there if that's a format that interests you. And if not, I hope you enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the videos regardless. And, uh, you know, hopefully sometime in time I'll see you in the queue for uh, Cube because I think it's uh, one of the next 200-card singleton, likely my favorite format. All right, thank you very much, and take care.